So we're talking about the immune response. So the breadth of... Con this is in Nature Medicine, published March 16th. What is today? Right now, it is March 16th. So this was published today. Uh, breadth of con uh, concomitant immune responses prior to patient recovery, a case report of non-severe COVID-19. So I looked at this paper briefly, and what this paper went into detail about was... Is there an immune response? Was there an appropriate immune response to COVID-19? This one does look at one particular patient and a non-severe form of the virus. Uh, so they didn't develop a uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And they analyzed this patient and looked at the immuno reaction. So how long did it take them to form an antibody response to that specific antigen so here this is also a correspondence so this is kind of like a letter to the editor so we report the kinetics of immune responses in relation to clinical and virological features of a patient with mild to moderate coronavirus oh i never shared this so mild to moderate coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 that required hospitalization. So the patient was in the hospital, but they weren't ever put on a ventilator. So increased antibody secreting cells stands for ASC, uh, follicular helper T cells, TFH, or an activated CD4 plus T cells and CD8 plus T cells, immunoglobulin M and IgG antibodies that bound COVID-19 causing coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 were detected in blood before symptomatic recovery. I, this is heavy in immunology terminology. But yes, it's part of the, yes, bi biovium. It's part of the adaptive immune response. So T cells are an important part of the adaptive immune response. Uh, it's called your cellular mediated immune system. So your cellular uh, mediated immune system is producing these T cells. Humoral mediated immune system is producing antibodies. This is looking at the immune response in this particular patient. Could this be the same in every patient? No. This is why it's you know, kind of written as you know, a correspondence in a way. The key parts here is that the antibodies we just talked about were found in blood before symptomatic recovery. So you get the symptoms and then your body starts mounting that immune response and your those, these cells of your immune system, these T cells specifically, eventually meet the demand that you need for treatment and then the symptoms will start going down once you have it. So these immunological changes persisted for at least seven days following full resolution of symptoms. So they, it was a 47-year-old uh, woman from Wuhan that they did this testing on. Her symptoms commenced four days earlier with lethargy, sore throat, dry cough, pleuritic uh, chest pain, that's lungs, uh, mild dyspnea, and subjective fevers. Mm -hmm. So we won't go through all this detail. It was tested via RT-PCR. No other respiratory pathogens were detected. No antibiotic steroids or antiviral agents were administered. Her symptoms resolved completely by day 13, and she remained well at day 20 with progressive increases in plasma, uh, SARS-CoV-2 binding, IgM, and IgG antibodies from day 7 until day 20. Okay, as pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines are predictive of severe clinical outcomes for influenza, we quantified... So this is that little... I know that's a lot of immunology talk. Um, we quantified 17 pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines in plasma. So those are the, like the things your cells are making to boost your immune response. Okay, here, let's get to the end. So collectively, our study provides novel contributions to the understanding of the breadth of kinetics of the immune responses during non-severe case of COVID-19. This patient did not experience complications of respiratory failure or uh, acute respiratory stress syndrome, did not require oxygen and so forth. We have provided evidence on the recruitment of immune cell populations together with antibodies that 
So SARS specific SARS-CoV-2 binding antibodies in the patient's blood before the resolution of symptoms. So right here it says this patient had an immune response, made the antibody specific to SARS-CoV-2, and that's what was one of the helping things to get rid of the symptoms. We propose that these immune parameters should be characterized in larger cohorts of people with different disease severities. So if they look at a certain stage, they look at the antibody production in the serum and the symptoms of that person and they see, okay, their antibodies are not up to the level they should be. And there's too much of a delayed response that could give the doctors an idea this person's gonna have a more severe symptoms in a couple of days. Whereas if a person has a higher level of these antibodies in the blood or these specific cell types in the blood, it suggests that that person's on the track to recovery a lot faster than someone who might be potentially a few days away from very severe problems. Uh, so here, determine whether it could be used to predict disease outcome, like I just chatted about, and evaluate new interventions that might minimize severity and or inform protective vaccine candidates. Furthermore, our study indicates that robust multifactorial immune responses can be elicited to the newly emerged virus, and similar to the avian H7N9 disease. Early adaptive immune responses might correlate better with clinical outcomes. So the faster your immune system responds to the presence of the virus, the better the eventual outcome. I think someone asked this earlier, uh, but suggestions on ways to strengthen our immune system, usual stuff. You wanna know the biggest one? With all this time we have at home now, use it to sleep. Sleep is one of the best ways to boost your immune system. Moving on now, so we just talked about the immune response. So we built up this immune response. Now, there are stories going around about possibilities of reinfection. So if you build up this immune response, that's your primary exposure. Then you're getting to the secondary exposure where if you get exposed to it again, if you had the primary, you have the memory cells like this paper just talked about, and then you never, you fight it off right away and never get a secondary exposure. So I found this other paper posted March 14th, so two days ago. These authors are all from, it looks like, the Institute of Laboratory Animal Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Med uh, Medical Sciences is where most of these are from. So the title of this article, Reinfection Could Not Occur in SARS-CoV-2 Infected Rhesus Macaques. Or the Rhesus Macaques are monkeys. So the longitudinal tracking of re-exposure after the disappeared symptoms. So they had monkeys they gave the virus to. The ones that recovered, they tried to reinfect. So here have a risk of relapse or reinfection. So after the monkeys had their symptoms disappear, the SARS-CoV-2 infected monkeys was then performed again. We found weight loss in some monkeys, viral replication mainly in nose, pharynx, lung, and gut, as well as a moderate interstitial pneumonia at seven days post initial infection after the primary infection. So normal effects here that we expect to see. After the symptoms were alleviated and some specific antibody tested positively, the half of the infected monkeys were re-challenged with the same dose of SARS-CoV-2 strain. That's important. So you're infecting one half and leaving the other half to go because what if the infection came back on its own? Notably, neither viral loads and nasal pharyngeal and anal swabs along the timeline nor viral replication in all primary tissue counterparts at five days post reinfection was found in re-exposed monkeys. So this is suggesting that a secondary exposure is fought off with no symptoms. Combined with the follow-up virologic, radiological, and pathological findings, the monkeys with re-exposure showed no reoccurrence of COVID-19, similarly to the infected monkey without re-challenge. Taken together, our results indicated that the primary SARS-CoV-2 infection could protect from subsequent exposures, which have the reference of prognosis of the disease and vital implications for vaccine design. So do we believe that there's no reinfection? Let's look at their, their, their data here. All right, I wanna check out the methods in this paper. If you're analyzing this paper, what could be the problem here? And yes. N equals four. That's not a big N value. So in science, you want your N value to be as large as possible to make it sure that your data is significant and it's actually not error that's causing your results. Yeah, yeah, um, adding more monkeys, of course, is expensive, but here it is, it's tough. Um, 
And remember, only half of these were selected to go forward then. So they were uh, all intratracheally challenged with SARS-CoV-2. So then they washed them, got the clinical signs. They all had weight loss. This is showing what we talked about earlier. They did RT-PCR to confirm it. And then they had uh, negative RT-PCR results that ended it. And then subsequently, only two infected monkeys were intratracheally re-challenged with the same dose to check in, uh, reinfection. They didn't find reinfection. M3 monkey, ooh, was euthanized and necropsied at five days post reinfection. Five days, that might not be long ago enough to confirm the viral replication and histopathological changes caused by re-exposure compared to the M1 monkey at seven DPI, no viral replication in all tissues. Therefore, our results suggested that monkeys with SARS-CoV-2 infection after recovery could not be reinfected with the same strain. Longitudinally, the monkey undergone single infection in the study did not appear the recurrence after the recovery either. So the takeaway from this study here, it's an important study. I'm not taking away from it or trying not to. The problem is they only tested four monkeys total and then one was euthanized at day five after reinfection. So it's promising, but it needs more work, like most science. Yeah, so this is suggesting, again, this is preprint here, the preprint server for biology. These are preliminary reports that have not been peer reviewed. They should not be regarded as conclusive, guide clinical practice slash health related behavior or reported in news media as established information. This is just showing what their data suggests. And of course it needs to be confirmed. Yeah, so it does suggest that you can only get COVID-19 once and that those reinfection stories might have been false negatives and positives from those individuals.